well in the previous lecture i tried to explain what is sociology and uh, i mainly use uh, two books alex inkels and gisbert though uh, other introductory books would also be talking about the same thing but in different manner now in this lecture uh, i will try to explain how sociologists work in uh, in actual application of their ideas to research problems before this uh, i forgot to mention when i was talking that according to alex inkels one approach is what did the founding fathers do i have explained what did the founding fathers do then what do sociologists do today sociologists uh, study human behavior society social structure processes phenomena like family religion economic institutions crime and deviance and the third question what does the region suggest alex inkel would say that sociologists will make a sort of encyclopedic or holistic study of human behavior all other disciplines like uh, anthropology or political science or economics make a study of one specific aspect of behavior like economists will study uh, rational behavior production and distribution of wealth equity equality or inequality political scientists will study governance forms of state forms of governance anthropologists will study tribes beliefs religions social organization of a small preliterate tribal society mostly though anthropologists have also studied urban industrial organization but mostly small organization psychologists will make a study of human personality or the relationship between social context and personality formation sociologists will study everything so relationship between economy and society a relationship between personality and social movements a relationship between religion and forms of governance and sociologists make encyclopedic study interdisciplinary sociologists also make study of residual phenomena means important issues of human society which are not studied by anyone else are studied by sociologists so if there is something if there is a new research question and you want to decide uh, to whom you would like to give this research nobody has studied something there is some new problem nobody has studied say terrorism terrorism is a new problem nobody has studied terrorism imagine it has been studied but suppose terrorism is a new issue and it has not been studied by anyone and you are as a donor going to decide to whom should such a study be given to economists or anthropologists or to political scientists or to whom then your first choice would be sociologists because you may think that sociologists uh combine concepts constructs ideas from all the disciplines sociologists will make a holistic study and they will explain the phenomenon of terrorism by considering religion political systems economic conditions education everything so let us give this study to sociologists nobody other than sociologists studies complete society so this is one domain complete society is studied by sociologists only interdisciplinary studies or relationships between variety of social phenomena uh is studied by sociologists 
and something which nobody studies but is important aspect of human behavior that that is also studied by sociologists so now method i think now you have after listening to me for one hour you have already come to that stage when you can identify uh, in whose framework or by using what approach i am studying something uh, as studied by different sociologists i want to take up some concrete phenomena suppose uh, uh, i take the issue of migration i could take up any other issue suppose i take the issue of migration migration means movement of people from one place to another that is migration now one way of studying migration would be to identify different classes in society migration in india suppose i say migration in india and i begin with that with respect to production or distribution means economic phenomena what are the constituent classes of india classes means mainly economic classes and i broadly divide uh, classes of india into these kinds of categories uh, manufacturers owners of industry owners of means of production owners of means of production you may call them capitalists or bourgeois then middle classes middle classes middle class is a very large and expanding class this includes managers senior managers engineers medical doctors professors also clerks insurance agent all those if i make a definition like this that all those who are working on or who found a place in economy on the basis of their credentials education they constitute the middle class middle class people are earning from their credentials these people owners of means of production they are earning from their capital they have capital they have invested their capital in industry they have opened a new industry in some india some part of india and earning from the profit capitalists are earning from profit these people middle classes are earning from wages honorarium fellowships uh in some cases shares but the source for them is their credential degrees and diploma credentials degrees diplomas btech mtech phd mba mtech eh? mbbs md ms msc's credentials degrees diploma and there is a third class of laborers and i study migration according to these classes what do i study in migration migration rate causes of migration impact of migration on their life
this can be one kind of study and my issue is that if a society is divided into three classes like this that there are some who earn from profit and there are others who earn from wages these people earn from wages in between there may be a small or big in our case a large expanding class of people whom you can put in the category of middle class who are earning from their degrees and diplomas who are not capitalists because they are not earning from capital they are not earning from profits they are not laborers because they are not earning from their labor power they are earning from their brain power they are working in manager actually in industry major decisions today are taken by these people not by these people these people are interested only in the profit part you give them profit but day to day decisions regarding buying selling management administration upgradation of technology networks ventures in other countries change in production all major decisions are taken by these people day to day decisions are always taken by these people. and we want to study what is migration what is migration rate what are causes of migration what is impact of migration on the life how important is migration for them when society is seen to be divided into these classes then i am following a particular approach out of five five founding fathers i wrote on the board in the first lecture august comte emile durkheim herbert spencer max weber and karl marx i am following one approach and in this case the approach is reflected or approach is decided mainly by the fact that i divide society according to economic classes i see social phenomena including migration as manifesting in different form in different economic classes of india i don't believe that uh, you can ever think of a human being abstracted from socio economic conditions a human being exists in a definite milieu and that milieu is decided largely by economic conditions characteristics or features of society characteristics and features of individuals are largely decided by economic conditions and second that in economic interests of people belonging to different classes there is a contradiction or clash of interests owners of means of production are interested in profit laborers are interested in wages there is always a contradiction in uh, interests of them and then i apply this idea of division of society into hostile contradictory uh, divided uh, dualistic kind of class formation in society to study all other social phenomena i am following one particular approach in this approach i also assume that all other institutions of society family marriage religion expressive art philosophy morality religion all things are determined by economic uh relationships i also assume that the society is divided according to power and the people who are owners of means of production are powerful people and those who do not have access to means of production those who survive on their labor they are the powerless people 
I also assume that uh, morality or legal or political or religious ideas of the time are those which serve the interests of the capitalist class, bourgeoisie, and which keep the people belonging to labor class in dark. Religion, superstition, magic, palmistry, sects, denominations of religions, ideologies, ideology of democracy, adult franchise, all ideas, ideas of nuclear family, joint family, altruism, social service, welfare state, state taking care of needs of most classes, most people, welfare state, all ideas are determined by condition of these people or interests of these people. And then I say what role does migration play in the development of society on the one hand and in promotion of the interests of the bourgeoisie. I am following one approach. Is it clear? I am studying migration, but I am studying migration first by dividing the entire society into two hostile classes, a class of bourgeoisie who own means of production and another class of laborers who survive on wages, who are powerless, dependent, alienated, dissatisfied, dissatisfied with working condition who suffer, whose life is miserable, they are just surviving. And then relate everything else, facts and ideas, to this basic division of society. In between you can think of some middle classes. You may assume that middle class is a passing phenomenon and eventually the whole society will get divided. As the capitalist accumulation takes place, as society advances further, it will get divided into two classes only, bourgeoisie and proletariats, bourgeoisie and workers, and facts and ideas of the time can be related to this basic class division. I am following one approach. Another approach can be that suppose I come from mathematics background and I have become a sociologist. People from different backgrounds have come and they have become sociologists. And I uh, come from mathematics, so statistics background, and I become a sociologist and I study migration. So, first approach is studying migration. in the framework of CLASS. This is the most important concept in this approach, class. It's studying migration in the framework of class. And there are basically two classes, powerful people, powerless people. Why are powerful people powerful? Because they own means of production. Why are powerless people powerless? Because they have no access to means of production and they survive on wages. They are poor people. They survive on wages. They have only manual labor with them. They, can only, they have to work for their survival. They own nothing except their labor power. And you study migration or other phenomena in the framework of class. Second approach. You say that there is a relationship between migration and industrialization. Here you are not referring to classes, you are referring to a process 
by which proportion of those engaged in industrial activities is increasing industrialization associated factors can be rise in per capita income rise in energy use per capita energy consumption per capita urbanization more and more proportion of population living in urban areas education contribution of non agricultural sector to production and changes of values westernization modernization but essentially it's a process of industrialization growing share of manufacturing sector in the economy is there a relationship between migration and industrialization does industrialization promote migration stop migration what is the connection if industrialization promotes migration what kind of migration and why why does it promote migration experience may show that before industrialization migration was not completely absent in tribal society also migration took place but that was a collective phenomenon in industrial society migration is individual individuals migrate later on they may also take their family members wives and children with them but essentially it is an individual phenomenon and if migration <coughs> if after migration their wives and children join them it is only their wives and children the whole joint family or the whole caste or community does not go with them an individual migrates from a village to bombay in search of employment he may remain alone there are migrants of this type who have remained alone for e for a year 5 years 10 years whole life they maintain connection with their native family native village come to their village two times three times a year send remittances but they live alone in bombay or some of them when they live comfortably they can carry their wives and children with them but even these people never carry the whole sub caste or caste or the whole village community with them it's an individual phenomenon so the nature of migration has changed in pre industrial society the whole tribe migrates in industrial society individuals migrate and why do individuals migrate because of employment opportunities in industry existing only for individual male workers initially most opportunities exist for individual male workers so there is one type of migration this is another approach a third approach i uh, try to develop a connection between first i divide uh, the history of society into certain stages say primitive uh, st stage of development stage of development primitive transitional on some basis modern post modern and migration what happens to migration as society develops through these stages starting with primitive transitional modern and now post modern what has happened to migration this can be another type of question in the fourth approach i say i am not interested in ideas or substantive uh, issues 
I want to build a model. I want to build a model of migration. Let me try whether some mathematical equation works in the field of migration. And I develop a model, a very simple model, Mij migration between a place I and a place J. Total number of people migrating between I and J, say Mumbai and Kanpur. In a given year, I take the sum of number of people who have migrated from Kanpur to Mumbai and those who have migrated from Mumbai to Kanpur. Mij, gross migration, volume of migration, total number of people who have migrated between Kanpur and Bombay. And I say that this is directly proportional to population of I. Common sense suggests that a smaller number of people will migrate from small places and more people will migrate from bigger places. So, lesser number of people will migrate from uh, say within a district from Kanpur, less number of people will migrate from uh, say Kalyanpur to Mumbai as compared to the whole of Kanpur city to the same place Mumbai. Size, uh, more people will migrate to Mumbai from UP as compared to more people from Jharkhand simply because the size of population of UP is more. So, more migrants from bigger places. Also, more migrants towards bigger places. More migrants from bigger places, more migrants towards bigger places. And migration is indirectly proportional to distance separating the two places. If I have a choice, if for employment related reasons I want to migrate from Kanpur to some place and suppose I get, I expect the same salary in Chicago as in Gwalior. What does logic suggest? I will move to Gwalior. I will not go to Chicago. Why should I go to Chicago when I am drawing the same salary in Gwalior? So, migrants, number of migrants or the gross or the volume of migration is indirectly proportional to distance separating the two places. So, that means Mij volume of migration between two places is a constant of proportionality k p i p j divided by d i j distance separating the two places d i j. Although you will laugh at this kind of connection, but I tell you in 40s in one of the best journals of that time, best journals of sociology from America, a model like this was suggested by a well known mathematical kind of sociology, GIF, Z I P F GIF. And it was called gravity model of migration because it looks similar to your uh, gravitational formula gravity model of migration. This is also an approach. And surprisingly, when GIF collected data on migration, on population, distances between cities and migration between cities for different modes of transportation. So what are modes of transportation? By road, by air, by train, by air, by car, by buses, by ship. When data were collected from different modes of transportation, it was found that in those days, this model fitted the data on migration, population and distances quite well. Okay. This is one approach. How does population grow? There are so many theories. But uh, it was found 
that if you use a logistic model, use your logistic growth model, logistic model of growth from mathematics, we say that initially population will grow at a very small pace as population grows, the rate of growth of population also increases, then at some time the rate of growth is maximum after which rate of growth is start declining but population continues to increase and comes a point when the size of population saturates logistic model of migration. And again surprisingly up to 1970s it was found by some mathematicians that populations of most countries, historical records of population for most countries showed that it is possible to fit the mathematical logistic model of uh, growth to data on size of population. This is also an approach. You can also in, in the fifth approach, you say that I am not happy with all these approaches. I basically want to talk to migrants and I want to know actually why did they migrate, in what circumstances they, they took the decision of migrating, in the same circumstances in the village some people migrate, some do not. And no matter what conditions are, poverty, deprivation, shortage of rainfall, excessive rainfall, literacy, illiteracy, equality, inequality, violence, non-violence. Why do some people only migrate, not others? What, are the, what is the difference between those who migrate and those who do not migrate? What are actually the meaning, the subjective idea, the subjective uh, notions their dreams, aspirations, their understanding of migration, that only will help me in deciding what are the causes of migration. This can be another approach to study migration. Now you see these approaches are reflective of what the founding fathers of sociology thought. Karl Marx was one. Karl Marx, uh, some people do not think that Karl Marx is a sociologist, but the very fact that according to some people the whole sociology is either the defense of Marxist theory or a critique of Marxist theory. Some people think either sociologists are subscribing to Marxist ideology, Marxist theory of society or they are providing a critique, Max Weber provided a critique of Marx, Marxist theory. You can never ignore the contributions of Karl Marx. Karl Marx, this approach of dividing society into two, two groups, two classes, he calls classes, on the basis of access to means of production is the Marxist approach. And the kind of questions Marxists will ask, suppose Marxists are studying family. So for Marxism, some most interesting questions in studying family would be, how do the family values or how do the ideas injected by the institution of marriage and family in our society, in young children's mind, serve the interests of the capitalist class, how do they maintain the values of capitalist society. Like family may say, one of, the, uh, one of several ideas that children learn during the process of so socialization from their parents, learn the idea of submission, submitting to authorities, submitting, submitting to elderly people, in family context, submitting to elderly people suppressing their own ideas, suppressing their own feelings, their own thinking and 
in so called respect following the instructions of the elderly people or el or those who are in power submission to authority submission to power marxists will say that a contribution that family makes in capitalist society is to teach the value of submission to children in the process of socialization our children start submitting to authority this is what capitalist society wants capitalist society wants that our laborers our middle classes should be such that they submit to those ideas ideologies political moral legal views which serve the interests of the dominant class this is what marxism wants so marxist theorists would be interested in this how does the existence of family serve the interests of the capitalist class the capitalist class requires labor power imagine if the capitalists themselves have to produce and rear the workers how much money they will have to spend on production and raising of rearing of workers and inculcating ideas of submission etc in young workers mind enormous capitalism will not survive so family as an institution of society in capitalist framework in capitalist society family does it freely for the existence of the capitalist class in in capitalism workers are often unhappy they, nobody like their work if you conduct a survey of uh, workers in india middle classes or lower classes you will find that majority of people are unhappy with work not only students are unhappy with the studies you are unhappy with the studies padhne mein koi maza nahi aata we don't see the meaning why, why are we taught uh, sociology why are we taught laws of thermodynamics why are we taught uh, so much of chemical engineering or these this language that language huh? why should we don't see the meaning we are doing it because we we have known or we have internalized the value of submitting to authority or we think that money is the most important reward in life and after passing through this torture of 4 years of btech program at iit kanpur we can get a decent job which will fetch a lot of money i can look for perks of up to 70 lakh per year if i successfully qualify uh, in this btech program there is no other fun there is no fun in education there is no fun in study but at the end of this tunnel i will find some light if uh, 70 lakh a package of 70 lakh similarly workers are workers are unhappy family by creating this of love happy life this or that keep these workers happy so they keep on working for the capitalist class marx step this is marx step approach this modeling type of this is positivist approach naturalist positive positivist approach if emile durkheim was alive today and if emile durkheim was to study migration he would do the same thing which gif do, uh, did in his study of migration uh, by using this kind of gravity model meaning of migration max weber analytical approach subjective meanings study the meaning in one uh, phenomenological or bavarian study of migration i found that the author equated migration from one place to another to a kind of religious conversion that as people convert from one religion to another from christianity to islam or islam to christianity or hinduism to islam or christianity to hinduism at the subjective level somewhere in the mind migration does same kind of thing max weber weberian approach 
this uh, relationship between migration and industrialization relating one fact of society to another fact migration may be high or low industrialization may be high or low studying relationship between two social facts this is what emile durkheim's approach suggests this is also what comte suggests this is the study of social statics social statics so in social statics we relate one pattern to another pattern and uh, this is uh, the positivist naturalist approach of comte and emile durkheim one fact to another in this when we relate migration to development of society this is again naturalistic approach in which we are trying to link one aspect of society migration to stages of development is this not the same thing which uh, comte suggested by giving the concept of social dynamics so in statics dynamics this is statics this is dynamics one aspect to another aspect whether society has high migration or low migration high industrialization or low industrialization this may this may be studied cross sectionally or longitudinally with time or by comparing different societies one fact with another social statics social dynamics one one th or uh, this is also in conformity with the approach of herbert spencer herbert evolution society evolves one can even say that this is in the uh, framework of herbert spencer industrialization all societies will industrialize and if all societies will eventually industrialize what will happen to migration this is also to follow there is so much of similarity that's why gisbert combines all of them into one category they are positivist or naturalist approaches by comte by emile durkheim by herbert spencer are positivist and naturalist they study human behavior in the same way in which scientists study natural experiment and this is analytical or subjective now this this kind of discussion can confuse our uh, beginners our new students of sociology that uh, if this is so if sociologists do not have one single tradition if sociologists do not have one particular approach if sociologists cannot agree on something then if i want to become a sociologist what kind of sociologist i would be uh, uh, it's a completely anarchic discipline can anybody become sociologist yeah. there are positive and negative sides of all all arguments yes uh, sociology uh, gives you complete freedom yeah. and yes there is more anarchy in sociology as compared to other disciplines if you want to take this anarchy or existence of multiple methods or multiple approaches as a negative aspect of a discipline yes this negativity is very much present in sociology those who like mathematical kind of sociology will not treat bavarian kind of sociologists as sociologists and those who give more importance to field work or anthropological tradition or bavarian tradition they will not give uh, they will laugh at the gravity type of migration model there is no communication between sociology this is a negative side if you call it a negative side but on the positive side is this not true that human behavior is so complex and has so many facets and uh, there is a very strong relationship between political interest or interest in general and understanding of a subject that sociology has to be like this only yeah. if sociologist that means on any subject it will be difficult to have a complete consensus regarding methods approaches and inferences and in all matters there will be managerial approach those who are 
part of the state. Uh, they will have one approach, you can call it managerial approach in general, those connected with governments, with running the system, like planning commission in case of India or ministry sociologists, they will be experts or scientific sociologists who have gone to the discipline of sociology out of scientific curiosity. They want to scientifically understand something. They are neither interested in running the government nor in uh, revolting, not in creating conditions of revolt against the government. They want to study sociology scientifically. And there will be many other sociologists who will say that uh, they reject both uh, managerial ap approach, experts approach. They actually want to see how do people themselves, people own meaning systems. People centric, people's perspective, managerial perspective, sociology can be done from managerial perspective, sociology can be done from experts perspective. And sociology can also be done from people's perspective. What is poverty? Managerial perspective. How to define poverty line? Some of you who are in the habit of reading newspapers and magazines regularly must have seen last year there was a big debate on how to measure poverty. What is poverty line? How do you say when you calculate headcount ratio that in India today, 22.7 percent people are living below the poverty line. What does it mean? What is poverty line? So, there is a lot of managerial perspective because governments want to decide about this number for the purpose of benefiting poor people under different schemes of rural development and government has limited money. Government with that limited money cannot help everyone. So, government must have that approach to poverty uh, with which poor people can be helped in limited amount of resources. Experts perspective will be different. Experts would like to define poverty in a scientific manner. What is poverty? Suppose poverty, they will say that, they will start with some assumption that poverty may mean uh, uh, absence of access to certain facilities nutritious food, education, water, shelter, clothes, this and that. Then they will calculate what should be the poverty line for a person in India today. And they will themselves calculate what proportion of people are poor. But th there is another approach. How do poor people themselves see poverty? How do poor people themselves see the causes of poverty? How do poor people themselves see how poverty can be removed? Okay. So, there are various perspectives and this is both a positive aspect of sociology and a negative aspect of sociology. A study of sociology is very challenging and adventurous. Uh, I would say uh, it is fun to study sociology and a study of sociology can also produce dissatisfaction in your mind if you think that like economics, sociologists should also arrive at some fixed conclusions. So, we stop here.